come on, I deserve better than that. I'm just teasing. <laughs> just teasing. It's good to be with you guys this morning. How's everybody doing? That was the most unconvincing good. That was like painful good. I'm good. And it is uh, good to be here this morning. I am, uh, I'm doing pretty well. I had a donut during Sunday school. How many know that Sunday school and donuts are the most spiritual thing that you can do sometimes, right? Amen. Hey, I just want to say thank you for those who prayed for me a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, some of you had no idea that I wasn't doing well, but I had got a spider bite. I'll show you a picture. It's really cool. Um, and uh, I was on some really heavy antibiotics, and then I was also fighting off like a chest cold. I was just kind of burning the, the candle at both ends. And uh, I, was, I was just in this deep fog in early service. Uh, I, my legs were shaking the entire time I was preaching, and I didn't know if I was going to get through second service. And so uh, at the end of first service, people prayed for me, um, didn't feel any different. I went down, I laid down in a, a, a closed office for the, all of Sunday school, just trying to get better, just trying to get strength, and, and uh, it came out. Uh, second service, and in the first verse of the first song, I just felt God's presence come over me, lift the fog off of my mind, gave me strength. My legs stopped shaking, and I had enough energy and clarity of mind to be able to speak that Sunday. So I just want to say that as a testimony, that prayers are answered, you know, and, and God, uh, God wants to do that. And sometimes, you know, like obviously I wish that when I was praying before early service that, that God would have just taken from me that, that from me in that instance. Um, but, but how many know that sometimes God just knows exactly when we need it and how we need it? And I just want to let that just be a testimony this morning uh, to maybe someone that's praying for something, that God hears those prayers and, and he will come through in, in the way that he needs to come through. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. The title of my message is not what I hoped for. Now, how many have ever been to a restaurant and you are looking through the menu, you order something, and out comes the waitress, out comes the waiter, plops the plate down on your, your table, and you just kind of sit back and you look at it and you go, this is not what I hoped for. Anybody ever had that experience? That is me every time I order a steak. Okay, I, I like my steak cold in the middle. Does anybody else like it cold in the middle? Yeah, there's a couple people are looking at it. I'm, I'm like, literally, I tell the waiter, the waitress, I'm like, I want it as rare as you can possibly make it. In fact, if you've got a cow out back, slap it on the rear and put it on the plate. That's perfect. <laughs> and without fail, every time the steak comes to my table, I think, this is not what I hoped for. This is not what I hoped for. No, it's not that I don't enjoy a good steak. And I'm sure I, I enjoy it, but it just could be a little bit better if it just had that nice chill in the morning, uh, in, in the middle. You know, or, or maybe it's not necessarily with food, um, but maybe you started a new job, or, or maybe uh, you entered into a new relationship, or you transferred schools, and you get a month or two weeks in, or uh, however long in, and all of a sudden you just have this thought, man, this is not what I hoped for. You know, Elizabeth and I, as, as horrible as this sounds, after we had our, our first two kids, Sam, who's four and a half, and Paisley, who's uh, two and a half, uh, we got pregnant again quicker than we anticipated, mainly because I've got no self-restraint when it comes to my wife, can't keep my hands off her. And um, <laughs> hey, that's cool, we're married, that's what God wants, okay? So we're, we got pregnant earlier than we wanted to get pregnant, and... Um, and Elizabeth had the thought, this is not what I hoped for, okay? But uh, since we had our boy, we had our girl, Elizabeth decides, oh, this is going to be a great idea to uh, have a surprise because we don't have, you know, we, we've got boy clothes, we've got some girl clothes. Let's have a surprise. And I'm thinking, Pfft, you know? And uh, so, like, deep down in my heart, you know, we're praying, just like, God, just give us a healthy baby, give us a, a good pregnancy, you know, just keep mom and baby healthy. That's, that's exactly what I wanted, but there's also this side of me that was really praying for a boy. So I'm not going to stand up here and lie that when Essie popped out, I had just had this half second where I was just like, this is not what I hoped for, <laughs> right? Now, I know that sounds terrible, and I'm so thankful for, for my daughter. In hindsight, looking back, God knew what he was doing because there's only 18 months in between Essie and Paisley, which means that there's only one school year in between them. And I, my prayer is that they just become the best of friends, that they just tackle high school together, and they just have that bond. Now, if it would have been a boy, 
we've had like eventually a senior and a freshman, and that's just a big difference, right? They wouldn't have been as close as I would have hoped. So even though it wasn't necessarily what I hoped for, I understood after everything played out. And, and I'm, I'm assuming and guessing that we've all had moments where we've been let down because our expectations were not met exactly how we wanted or the way that they thought we thought they should be. This morning we're going to be taking a, a look at a short portion of text, which I think many might relate to this morning. And leading up to this text, Jesus had been crucified just three days before, but at this point, Jesus had risen from the dead, the tomb was empty, he's alive and well, but nobody had seen him yet, and nobody fully believed that he had really risen from the dead. So Luke 24, starting in verse 13, we're gonna read. Now the same day, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, power, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. God, your word says that where it's shared, it will not return void. So just begin to open up our eyes, open up our hearts. God, break up the soil of our hearts that we might receive this word, that we'd be challenged, God. I pray for those that haven't heard your voice in a long time and they just need a refreshing. They just feel like they just kind of need a spiritual Red Bull, that you would give them that this morning and that they would have a revelation of everything of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. So we see in our text that Jesus was walking and talking with these two individuals. They didn't know who they were, and, and, and it says for seven miles. Now, does anybody know the average pace in which someone walks? It's three miles an hour. I Googled it, and Google is a reliable source, just as reliable as Wiki. So, so you see that, that uh, these men potentially are walking with Jesus for about two and a half hours, and they had no idea who it was. Verse 16, it says they were kept from recognizing. Now, I'm not sure um, why they were kept from recognizing Jesus. It could have been that fresh out of the tomb haircut that Jesus was sporting, just like, you know, I don't recognize you, Jesus. You knew do. It could have been that in the evening it was extremely hot and, and Jesus was having and wearing something over his face and his neck to keep the sun off of him and keep him cool as he was walking. And so he kind of concealed himself. But the Bible doesn't really tell us why they were kept from uh, um, recognizing him. But I suspect that those two men were just plain missing Jesus, even though Jesus was right in front of their own two eyeballs. Maybe one of them was one eye and they had one eyeball. Either way, they were right in front of there. Why? Why did they miss Jesus? I believe it's because they needed a perspective change of the person of Jesus. They needed a perspective change of the person of Jesus. You look in your text in verse 19, and they said this of Jesus. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. See, they didn't view Jesus as Lord. They didn't view him as Messiah. They didn't view him as Christ. All they viewed him was as a powerful prophet who was dead. And it's likely that just 72 hours earlier, they watched with their own eyes Jesus die on the cross. It's likely that, that in all of this text that they saw and watched him cry out and breathe his last breath and hang on a cross. And they, it's likely that, that they watched him get taken off the cross and buried in, into the tomb. You know? and, and they believed Jesus to be dead. That was their view of Jesus. Why on earth would they be looking for Jesus as they're taking their evening, evening stroll? He was dead. In the second half of verse 17, it says that they stood still, their faces downcast. Why were they downcast? Why were they sad? The reason why is because they had the wrong perspective of the person of Jesus. Hear me this morning. And if, if we have the wrong perspective of Jesus Christ, 
that will lead to us being downcast, having a lack of hope, a lack of security, and a lack of joy in your life. But what happens in the following verses is simply amazing, and I really, my prayer is that it would happen to all of us this morning. Jesus begins to reveal all of these texts, all of these scriptures from the Old Testament. He begins to reveal everything that has been said about him, and slowly these two men walking with Jesus, not really fully knowing who he was in this moment, God begins to unpack who he was and who he is, and slowly their eyes begin to open, and then Boom, later on in that scripture, in this passage, it says, in an instant, their eyes were opened. That is my prayer for you this morning. But isn't it true that many of us have a limited understanding of who Jesus really is? That's dangerous because a limited view of who Jesus is will limit what Jesus can do in and for and through you. We cannot put Jesus in a box. We cannot forget all of the attributes of God we need to have a proper and healthy and full picture and understanding of who Jesus is. If you only view Jesus as your Prince of Peace, you forget him as mighty God, our warrior, the, the, the Lion of Judah. If we only viewed Jesus as a sacrifice of God, we forget that he is not just a sacrifice, but the Savior of the world. If viewed as only a friend, we forget that he's judge. If we focus only on his mercy and his grace and his love, then we forget about his just nature. It's possible that your perspective of Jesus as your hope, as your healer has been skewed because you have prayed for things and things haven't been answered exactly in the way that you thought or perceived or hoped that they would be answered and you've got this skewed vision of who Jesus is and your perspective of Jesus is wrong or limited. God wants to give each and every single one of you this morning a full picture of who he is. But there's a very real potential problem, and that is this, that some of you don't really want to know everything about Jesus. Some of you don't really want to to have that full picture. Did you know that there's people that never go to the doctor or the dentist because they would rather roll the dice on on their health than potentially hear, "Uh, you, you you need to stop eating so much sugar. You, you, you've got cancer. They don't want to hear the dentist say, hey, uh, your Diet Mountain Dew is doing a work on your teeth. You need to cut back the pop intake, right? Did you know that there are people that literally will stray from someone that is truth and telling the truth because they just don't want to hear it? Is that true today in you? I mean, are, are we shying away from all of Jesus? Is, there's people who don't want to fully know who Jesus is because they have an authority issue. They don't want to see him as Lord, as master, as ruler. They just want to see him as friend and savior. You know, you take what you want and leave what you don't. We, we have got to get the full picture of God, and when we get the full picture of God, that will completely change your life. It will completely change the way that you respond in services. It will completely change the way that your relationships and your marriages and your friendships and every aspect of your life will be changed when you fully see and your eyes completely see who Jesus Christ is. We need a revelation. We need a perspective change this morning. Jesus is not just a powerful prophet. He is not dead. He is surely alive. He is our peace. He is our hope. He is our master. He is our ruler, and he is Lord. Jesus Christ, he is sitting currently right now at the right hand of God our Father, intercessing for you because he wants you to have a breakthrough. He wants you to have a moment, an encounter, an experience with Jesus Christ himself, and he is praying for you. Man, that that just excites me. If you haven't accepted Jesus as Lord of your life at the end of today's message, I want to give the opportunity for you to respond and invite Jesus, not just to be a part of your life, not just to be a side chick, a part of your life, but to be the center of your life. Because he needs to be the center of it all. It all revolves around Jesus. I'm telling you, it, it all revolves around Jesus. But these men walking with Jesus, they didn't just need a perspective change on the person of Jesus. They needed a perspective change on the plan of Jesus, on the the plan of Jesus. In verses 20 and 21, the men said this, the chief priests and our rulers, they handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. See, these men were obviously familiar with Jesus' teachings and his ministry. They hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. They hoped that he was the Messiah. But the problem was, is that their idea 
and their understanding of the plan of Jesus, the plan of God, was skewed and it was off. It was popular belief to the Jews in that time that the, the Messiah, the Redeemer, was going to come and stomp out all enemies, all oppressors on earth and just stomp them out in very much like a militaristic uh, approach to Savior. But they completely ignored or they just didn't see in scriptures where, where it talks about the suffering servant. And it, and it talks about a man of, 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 of sorrows and, and being um, beaten and, and crushed for our iniquities and our transgressions. And so you see these men having a wrong perspective of the plan of God, and therefore they miss Jesus walking with them. And they were looking for this knight in shining armor. They, they thought they fully understood God's plan. It makes me think of a story of a, a man who has found himself on top of his roof, his whole city, his whole neighborhood was, was uh, being flooded, and it was this massive flood, and waters were raising, uh, rising quickly. And, and he's on this, this roof, and he cries out. He goes, God, Jesus, save me. And pretty soon up drives this boat, and the man on the boat says, come on, get in. Before it's too late, get in. And he goes, no, that's okay. Jesus is going to save me. And the man's like, I'm here with the boat. Get in the boat. He said, Jesus is going to save me. He couldn't get him to go, so he went on. There's more people to save. About an hour later, this man finds himself up at the top of the chimney, hanging on for dear life, and all of a sudden, in comes the National Guard with a helicopter and a rope ladder, drops it down to the man. He says, get on, climb up. He says, no, I pray Jesus is going to save me. And it wasn't long after that, the man was swept away. He drowned. He woke up in heaven. He says, Jesus, what's the deal? I prayed that you would save me. And Jesus says, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. What more could you ask for? Now, I know that's a bit of a dad joke, but here's the thing. (laughs) Hey, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, okay? (laughs) I know that that's that's just kind of like a a tongue-in-cheek way of putting it, but how often do we do the same thing where we pray for breakthrough, we pray for an answer, we pray for whatever, yet we're so fixated on how we think God is going to move that we completely miss the way that God is actually moving. Man, God always answers your prayers. Hear me, God is, does not have deaf ears. And he's not mute. He's answering your prayers. The problem is, is that oftentimes he answers them in ways that we don't expect or we don't like. God, change and remove this difficult situation, God. Remove this person from my life. Remove this, remove that. And God's answer is, hey, instead of removing this, I'm going to walk you through this. You're going to grow through this. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to bring people along you to encourage you and challenge you and pull you through. I will be with you through the fire. And we're like, but God, that's hard. I don't like that answer. God, do you even love me? I prayed for this to be removed and you haven't done a thing about it. And God's saying, I'm with you. What do you want from me? I'm answering your prayers and we're just, we're just there. Every once in a while, it's pretty much like every other day, my kids just ask me stupid questions. <laughs> Daddy, can we have ice cream for breakfast? Yes, we can have ice cream for breakfast. There's some mornings where I really would like that. That would be awesome. Or, Daddy, can I drive your truck all by myself? Daddy, I don't, I don't want to wear sunscreen today. I, I'm just not going to do that. You know, I don't think my kids are stupid. I, I, don't, I don't rebuke them for, wanting them, to, to, for them wanting to drive my truck, but I understand that they're ignorant about a lot of things in life. Eating ice cream first thing in the morning is not a good plan. Driving my truck is, is at least not a good plan until you can see over the steering wheel reach the pedals. I can just imagine right now Sam telling, like in Toy Story, Sam telling Paisley, gas, brake, and he's going like this, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I know as a parent and through experience that like, man, the sun is nothing to be messed with, you know. Like, you, you get too much sun, you can have a lot of pain from sunburns. You can even get sick from having sun poisoning. Has anybody ever experienced that? That's miserable. I have. But how just dumb and, and childish would it be if, if in responding to their requests and responding to their questions, they, they just said, you know what, Daddy? No, you don't really know what you're talking about. No, 
The sun ain't got nothing on me. Oh, it's safe to drive your truck. Ice cream is actually very nutritious in the morning, you know. And, and they were just to like, just completely tell me that the, my answer is wrong. That's, that's ignorant, that's childish, that's foolish. But how many times do we do the same thing where when we pray and God moves, we say, ah, oh, God, I don't like that answer. We throw this tantrum, we think, God, God, you don't even love me. You must not even love me. Mommy loves me more than you, you know. And we throw these tantrums about the way that God has a plan and is answering our lives. We need to remember this morning that God's ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, and God has a reason of how and and when and where he moves and why he moves. Some of you need a perspective change of God's plan. You need to throw away your expectations of life and start rolling with, with his plan. You need to simply just say, Lord, however you want to move, however you want to answer this prayer, whatever your plan is through all of this, I submit to it. I trust it. I'm good with it because I know that you are good and your plan is good. I trust you. There are times that we plumb don't understand. There are times when our answers and our our questions, our uh, requests before God, our prayers, that they just don't get answered in the way that we want. How many have ever been there? This week at camp, I've been going to camp either as a a student or a counselor of some capacity for 21 years. This this was probably the number one sermon I have ever heard at a camp. And the the pastor, uh, Scotty Gibbons, he he just simply posed this question. What is your response when God doesn't answer your your prayer requests? What are are we going to do? What what are we going to do if God doesn't give us the miracle that we ask? What's our response? And he told the students this. It's this, don't allow what you don't understand about God to keep you from trusting what you do know about God. There is so much that I don't understand about God, but there is plenty that I do understand about God. Romans 8, 28 says this, for we know, we know, say that, and we know, say it again, and we know that in all things, Everything, in the pain, in the suffering, in the sorrows, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Man, what do we do when God's plan doesn't make sense, when we don't understand, when we can't see light at the end of the tunnel? We go to what we know. We go to what we know because God brings purpose to our pain. See, pain without purpose is just unbearable. You can't hardly take it. But, but what God does is in your pain, in your suffering, he begins to bring a purpose in it. There is a story in your suffering. There, there is a song in your suffering. And, and how many know that when you have purpose through the pain, it can make you endure so much more than you could ever possibly imagine? You know, I, 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 I hate working out. I really do. Like, I know I should because, I'm, I mean, I'm working on my dad bod. You know, I'm, I'm getting there. But, you know, it's, it's just, I, I hate it. But I look at people and they, they bench press and they go to fail. You know, that's, that's what it's all about, uh, lifting weights. You know, you go to fail. And so you're just pushing, you're pushing up, you're pushing the bar, and you can't get the bar any further. And there's just excruciating pain and your muscles are tearing and breaking down. Why would anybody do that? Because there's purpose behind the pain. Man, this morning, some of you haven't found your purpose in your pain, and God wants to reveal that to you this morning so that you can endure more than you ever thought you might be able to endure, so that you can have a story and say, you know what, although I don't understand what's going on, although I don't understand why I lost my job, although I don't understand all the persecution that I'm receiving, I can still praise my Lord and Savior because he is good, he has saved me, and I know that underneath it all, even though I can't see it, even though I don't know it, even though I can't understand it, he is working for the good in my life. I can stand on it, I can know it, and I can be assured the same God that was faithful yesterday is still faithful today, and he'll be faithful tomorrow. All you have to do is open up the scriptures and just see prophecy and promise fulfilled time and time and time again. Some of your 
you need a perspective change of how God is moving in your life. You need to drop your expectations and simply let God move the way he sees fit. What if we approached God in prayer with a completely open mind and an open, uh, just, just blank slate? So often we enter into the throne room of God with our agenda. So often we enter into a time of worship or prayer and request. And when we, we just, we know what we want, we know what we need, and we're just going to get it from God. Right? What if we just went in there just saying, God, you are God, I'm not. You know everything, I do not. However you want to move, I submit to it, I trust you because you're good. And just as simply, do you think that maybe, just maybe, your perspective would change and you'd begin to see God move in ways in your life that you aren't even recognizing right now. It's like he's been moving this whole time. It's like he's been walking and talking with you for the last two and a half hours and you've been completely oblivious to what God is doing. Maybe, just maybe, if we went before God without any presuppositions, expectations, we would begin to see him move in the mundane. Let's be a people with the correct perspective of the person the plan, and finally the promise of Jesus. Again, both of these men were obviously familiar with Jesus' teaching and his ministry, but they didn't always fully understand the promises that he made, and they didn't fully understand the promises of Scripture. They didn't understand the promise that on the third day that he would rebuild the temple, which was actually his body. They didn't understand the promise of the Holy Spirit or what that would look like. They didn't understand how he was going to make a new way for people to access God. They didn't understand um, why Jesus said it was good that he went away. After all, I mean, he's this most amazing person that they've ever walked or talked with and seen do anything. You know, they, they didn't understand the promises of God. Now think about this. A little earlier, or excuse me, a little later in this chapter, the disciples are all hanging out in a house. Now, I can just imagine this is 72 hours after Jesus has been crucified. All of these men have followed him. They had, they had put their eggs in the basket, but at this point, it seemed like a lot of them had picked their eggs back up, and they're like, I don't know what to do at this moment. They're in this house. They're gathered together. They're likely scared. They're likely questioning. They're, they're confused. They have no idea what's going on. Do you know that maybe you're kind of in that same situation? Yet, yet what happened in that moment? God himself, Jesus, had set in motion a plan to pour out his Holy Spirit. There was something that had shifted in the entire atmosphere of the world. In the temple, there was a veil that separated the presence of God into a, a room from the people because the people were unholy and God was holy. They could not be together. It was only the priests that could go back into this room, into the presence of God after a time of ritual cleansing. Yet in, in Matthew 27, verse 51, it's, it records, in, in all the Gospels, it records that Jesus let out a loud shout, and with that, the veil of that t in, in the temple that was separating the presence of God from God's people was torn from top to bottom. Why is it significant that the Bible records that it was re ripped from the top to bottom? Because it was symbolizing that God himself was making an access point from heaven, ripping it from heaven all the way down to the curtain saying, no longer will my presence just be contained into a room. I am making a way, I am preparing in this process where I'm about ready to pour out my Holy Spirit all across the earth, not just all across the earth, but into every person's heart. And the disciples were completely ignorant of this. Here they are, they're huddled, they're scared, they're in this room, they, they, they're questioning everything that's going on, and they are completely oblivious to what God has done. Can I just remind you this morning that God is working, and although you might be questioning, although you might be scared, although you might not fully understand it, God might be moving in a way that you have no idea, and Maybe something is about to shift in the entire world and you have no idea. You're completely oblivious to it. Man, I'll tell you what, that excites me. That pumps me up. That fires me up because I know that, that God is faithful. I believe that some of you, your promise is in process. I really believe that. But others of you, God has asked you to let go of something or someone, and your miracle, your breakthrough, 
your answer to prayer is being delayed because of your disobedience. Let's use our imagination a little bit. Luke is the author both of the book of Luke and Acts, and so he records just in the next book in Acts, Acts chapter 1, he records Jesus' words when Jesus tells and instructs his disciples. He says this, Stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift my Father promised. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now just, just, just use your imagination with me. What would have happened if they would have decided, you know what? Jerusalem's all right, but man, Capernaum's got the food, man. They have got good food. So let's go to Capernaum and let's wait in Capernaum for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Bethlehem and wait for the promise of, or or, or maybe they're like, yeah, we'll wait. But then after five days of waiting, they're like, you know what? I've waited long enough. La Fonda stinks. His kids won't shut up. I've waited long enough for, for this promise. And, and then just in that moment, there's just this act of disobedience. Would God, would, have, would he have still poured out his Holy Spirit? Would people have been baptized? We, we don't really know. We know in the story earlier in the Bible when the Israelites were promised the promised land and they send out the 12 spies and two of them come back and say, we can take it. And the other 10 are like, there's giants in the land. We can't take this. We can't take this land. This is crazy. We're going around. We're going a different way. How many know that their disobedience, even though that land was promised to them, God had marked it and sealed it and said, this is for you. Their disobedience delayed their answer to prayer. Man, sometimes your prayers are answered through your obedience. Let me say that again. Sometimes your prayers are answered through your obedience. God, Heal my marriage. Save my marriage. Sell your golf clubs and pray for your wife every morning. God, I need a financial breakthrough. I'm really treading water here. Can barely keep it afloat. How about start trusting me with your tithe? God, pour out your Holy Spirit in my life. All I want, I need more of you, and you promised Oh, God, you promised that you would pour out your Holy Spirit freely on me. Oh, you promised it. How about seek me on Monday and Tuesday? Your answered prayer is often tied to your willingness to obey what God instructs. This morning, I believe that some of you are so close to the answer of a promise And you know exactly what it is. And God's just going to begin to drop things in people's hearts. As we listen in just a minute, God is just going to begin to drop things in our minds. And you're going to know exactly what you need to let go of so that you can receive the gift of the promise this morning. Ask yourself this morning, do you need a perspective change of the person of Jesus, the plan of Jesus, or the promise of Jesus? Does the way that you worship truly reflect how you view Christ? Man, because if you really view Christ in all that he is, how can you not sing? How can we not praise? How can we not shout? How can we not clap? How can we not become excited? How can we not be moved to emotion? How can we not give everything that we have because we really realize that we got everything when we deserved nothing does your perspective of the person of Jesus need to be changed have you found that doing Christian things that they've become more of a routine than a passion we go to church because it's Sunday it's what we do and it's a race to the buffet there might be some that have walked with God so long that you've forgotten and you've started to take for granted what he's done in your life. You've been ungrateful for the manna that he's provided. And it's time that you have an awakening and appreciation of what and who Jesus is. It's like being married for 30 years. Maybe anniversaries used to be fun, spicy, a lot of fun but now they just kind of slipped into another day. 
date nights aren't great. You just kind of grown into this complacency of, of developing your relationship with your spouse. That might be kind of similar with your relationship with God. And, and it could be a, a deacon, leader, elder, former pastor, Sunday school teacher. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. But I believe that many of us need a full picture, a full perspective change of the person, the plan, and the promise of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me all across this room as the musicians come? It is so easy for us to get wrapped up with what we hope for that we miss the physical person of hope, Jesus Christ. And as a church family, we're all going to spend some time seeking for a perspective change. We're going to ask God to change our eyes so that we might see what he sees and feel what he feels and, and, and begin to understand little glimpses of what he knows where we can become confident and secure in the plan and the promises that he has for us. But with every eye opened, if you would say, you know, Austin, you've been talking this morning, and I realize that my perspective of who Jesus is 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 limited. It's not that, that, that you don't believe in God. It's not that you're not saved. It's not that you don't love Jesus with everything in, but you realize that maybe I'm, I'm only seven-eighths of the way there. Or maybe you're halfway there. And this morning, just in all honesty, you'd say, I need my eyes to be opened to who Jesus is, and I need a reminder, a refresh, a reset. If that's you, just all across this room, raise your hand saying, I need a refresh of who Jesus is and what he's done in my life. Yes. Yes. And what about those who, who feel like, man, I've been trying to cram my agenda, my plans, my expectations on the plan of God, and I need to s- just completely wipe things clean and just see how God sees about the plans in my life. And I need to be okay with the way that God is moving in my life. If that's you and say, man, I surrender my plans, my expectations. Right. His timing is better than your timing. Let me tell you. I'll tell you that all day long. And there's others of you that have been waiting for a promise. And you need to be reminded of the faithfulness of God. Man, God is so faithful. He is so good. And I think we just get into this Christian mode of, God is so good. He's so good. He's so good. He's so good to me. And we just kind of sing that, but we don't really realize what we're saying. Like, His faithfulness is amazing. The same God who was, is, is, and will be. And we can have confidence in that. If you struggle with seeing and living, you feel like your emotions and faith is just kind of a roller coaster and you're just up and down in that, can I encourage you to start journaling? Because as you journal, you'll begin to see answered prayers. And then in times of lowness, where you're just maybe a little bit like emotional in that moment, you're not thinking about what we do know, but you're just kind of letting circumstances, you can go back in your journal and see, wow, God answered that. Wow, God was faithful in that. Well, I, don't, I didn't even remember when he healed me of that. You know, and you just begin to see the faithfulness. And God is just leaving this trail of faithfulness where, where we can just have full confidence that he is with us. He's walking right beside us. We just have to open up our eyes. We need a perspective change so that we can see him in our midst. You close your eyes all across this room. I want to give the opportunity to anyone here that says, man, I, I, I need a perspective change of Jesus Christ because I need him to be the center of my life. I need him to be Lord of my life. I have yet to ask him to be master and ruler and savior. I turn from my sins. I, I, I say I'm sorry for my sins. And now I'm asking God, Jesus Christ, his son, to come into my heart, begin to change my heart, begin to change my desires. Not that I would be a better person, but that God would, would create in me a new heart by the transforming of the Holy Spirit of our minds and in our hearts and in our soul and our emotion and our being. And you'd say this morning, Austin, for the first time, I want to ask Jesus into my life. I need him to save me from my sin. And and I'm asking that this morning with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just raise your hand and look up at me so I can pray for you this morning? Is there anyone here? Yes. 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 Several. So many. Yes. Yes. Jesus. God, we are sorry for our sin. 
We don't just turn from our sin, but we turn to you. We set our eyes on you. And so everyone that raised their hand, just proclaiming that you are Lord, that you are Savior this morning, I pray that you would go in, that you would cleanse them of their sin, that you'd remove the stain of guilt and shame and sorrow, God, and you'd give them purpose, that you'd give them direction, that you would breathe life into their situation, Jesus. I pray right now that a, a, a presence of peace would just begin to flood this room and flood every heart, God, that they would receive the security of heaven, knowing that you have paid it all, that there's nothing that they can do to deserve heaven, but you have reached down, you have grabbed them and you have saved them from the pits of hell God and so this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit begin to transform those minds begin to transform those hearts change our hearts creating us a clean heart a pure heart oh God because we need you Lord and God I pray that they would find others that would surround them that would encourage them that they would run this race together in, in pursuit of all that you have for us in Jesus name we pray, amen. Now for the next about 30 seconds, this is what we're gonna do before we sing this song. We're just gonna take a moment to listen to what God is speaking because I believe that there are many perspectives that need to be changed. And it might be something completely unrelated, but we're just gonna take a moment to listen, to quiet our hearts. And then as we sing this song, I wanna open up the altars for anyone who would like to be prayed for, anybody who just feels like they need to do something outward because something's happening inward and you just can't help but come down and praise and worship God. We're gonna open up these altars, flood these altars, but let's just pray and take a moment just to hear from God this morning. Jesus, speak to us for we're listening, God. Jesus, I pray this morning, God, that we would leave here with a perspective change. With eyes wide open, hearts set on you. I pray for those feeling so discouraged, those overwhelmed, that as they turn their eyes upon you, that they would feel your strong arms embrace them, carry them through, God. Jesus, I pray for those that just haven't, that just haven't felt you, that they would exercise in this moment to go to what they know is true. They would be able to look back at moments in their life where they knew undoubtedly that you moved, that you answered, that you loved them. And God, I pray as they offer up just a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship when their hearts and their flesh don't feel like it, God, that you would honor that, you would embrace them with your presence, you'd embrace them with your love, and you'd remind them of who you are, God. So we set our eyes, our hearts, on things above. May we be heavenly minded. May we be eternally minded. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My prayer for you all is that we would all walk and live with the correct perspective of who Jesus is. And how cool would that be if this church started to walk in the fullness of who God is? What, what would your giving look like? What would your time look like? What would your energy, what would your words sound like? Where would you go? I believe that there are people being called to things and there needs to be obedience that follows to it. There's a, a lady in the early service that came up to one of our Chi Alpha pastors and said, I feel like I'm called to work with college students who are deaf. I don't know how many deaf college students there are, but there's not nearly as many deaf college students as there are regular college students. But you know, Jesus placed that specific heart on that lady's heart so that they could be reached. Because God's heart is that he would reach all. So it doesn't matter how small or how big, God will be with you, he will empower you, and he will send you out so that all may confess and know that he is Lord, amen. May God's face shine upon you. May his love fill you and spirit change your heart. God bless you and see you back tonight. Come on.